All right, what is up, guys? Welcome back to another Salt and Popper Saturday video. Today, we are talking about Outlaws of Thunder Junction. We have a brand new set to talk about for the Popper format. So uh, we're going to jump into a Popper set review for you guys. Uh, joining me today, we have Josh, a.k.a. Mayo, on the internet. What's up, man? Hey, that's me. And uh, we're going to uh, be rooting and tooting and uh, and put on our cowboy hats for this episode. So let's jump right in with our white section. Um, admittedly, slim pickings for this set. Uh, I had a tough time pulling really anything aside that I thought was going to be like better than stuff that exists already. But I found one in white, uh, which is Outlaw Medic. Uh, Outlaw Medic is a 1-3 for 2, uh, white and a colorless. It's a human rogue. It has lifelink, and when it dies, you draw a card. So um, this is very akin to, like, Dawnbringer Cleric, or um, what is the 1-3? The Erishin Cleric. Um, in that it's a very defensive body that gains you some amount of life and has some form of utility. Um, my biggest comparison to this card is actually, like, Wall of Omens, um, which is, you know, two-mana wall, basically, that draws you a card and gains you some life. Um, obviously, this is not as good as Wall of Omens, but that's, like, the closest comparison I could make. I think this card's probably pretty good. Um, it has relevant typing, because it is a rogue, which means it is an outlaw. Um, it is a human, which means there are some uh, human synergy cards that matter. Lifelink is a thing that works because humans like to put on equipment and suit up and make themselves big, which is cool. And then when it dies, it draws a card. Obviously, if it ETB'd and drawed a card, I thought it would be better. But um, this is an interesting one. I, I'm not sure where this goes, but I do think it's good enough to consider. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts here? Oh yeah, I hadn't actually compared it to Wall of Omens before, but that does give me a good name for this guy when I play him. <laughs> I'm just going to call him Blossom. Uh, Blossom? Yeah. Wall of Blossoms. Blossom. Oh, got it. Anyways. Um, yeah, I like him a lot. He's just... Honestly, I feel like this card is going to get more value in any deck that I play him in than uh, Seeker of the Hoywood, just because it draws a card. And sure, he, he gains the incidental life. Wow, Seeker like of the one. Way being replaced for this guy would be an absolute outrage, I think. Seeker of the Way is very, very powerful. But um, I do like that this draws a card. I like that it's a 1-3 body, so it blocks very well, especially against Goblin tokens and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the incidental life gain is certainly going to help. I don't know if it's better than Erishin Cleric in terms of just getting 3 and flickering it or bouncing it to gain another 3. That's definitely... Um, going to be deck specific i think in things like um sky fisher decks or flicker decks erishin cleric is certainly going to be a better choice or dawnbringer cleric is certainly going to be a, a stronger utility spot um but when you when you need something for like i don't know if there's a black white sacrifice deck out there or something like that or you end up playing some human deck um, with like one one counters or equipments, you know, this is certainly in that range um, where the lifelink mm -hmm. is going to be relevant and then the card draw you can cash in on later. Um, is this going to be the best white creature we've ever seen? Uh, no, but uh, I think realistically, uh, <laughs> you've got to temper your expectations. This set being kind of the debut of uh, play packs and showing us the new design space for better commons. Uh, really fell short of the mark for me, I think. This this set does not have, uh, like, powerful new commons. Um, but we move on to blue here. Um, Harrier Strix is the next card that's up. Harrier Strix is a 1-1 one, one bird for 1 blue. Um, it has flying, and when it enters the battlefield, it taps target permanent, and then it has an activated ability of 3 mana, draw, and then discord, uh, discard. Um... This card's interesting to me. Um, is this an absolute slam dunk in everything that plays blue? No. But is it good in certain blue matchups? And I think the answer is yes. Um, I put this card on the top 10 specifically because I like its ability to stop an opponent's counterplay. Uh, the ability to tap a permanent, not just a creature, is incredibly good. 
Um, you can akin this to like Judges Familiar, where it's a one drop that you can play into an opponent's open counter spell and it forces them into a really awkward place. Um, this is the same situation where you play this and then it taps down their open blue mana and they can't uh, hold up that counter spell or threaten that uh, response spell anymore. And then you're free to play whatever you wanted to cast in the first place after it. Since it's only a one mana um, spell, it doesn't tax you too much for that play pattern. And then later in the game, a, a three mana activated ability to loot is very good. Um, just especially in those control or mid range matchups where you're trying to outvalue or you know outdraw your opponent. Um, I think this card certainly has something to it. Um, what do what do you think of uh, Harrier Strix here? What are your what are your thoughts? I really like that the uh, cost on this, while three in some decks is uh, unimaginable, it's actually quite affordable in the blue decks that play it. So, mm -hmm. you know, like in the mid range and the control decks, like you're saying, or matchups rather, this card is going to be really good. And like, no one wants to counter it or kill it <laughs> that, that easily, right? Like, it's just a dinky 1 1 bird, but it does allow you some pretty um, advantageous play patterns for such a cheap investment. So, I like this card a lot. Agreed. Yeah, I think this is going to be one of those small value makers that just kind of makes the difference in a, an otherwise very difficult, like, draw-intensive matchup where you're counting on top decks or value spells and your opponent not top decking or hitting a value spell first um, in those very swingy kind of control mirrors. This card is really going to be able to tip the scales in your favor. It's not a card they're going to want to counter... Um, and then once it's on the board, it's just kind of a nuisance. It's going to ping for some damage. Um, it's definitely going to draw you some cards or filter through some lands. I mean, this card's going to put in a lot of work. It's very reasonably costed. Um, obviously, this is going to fall prey to a lot of the things that target fairies. You know, you can gut shot this. You can um, cast another fire, uh, ping this card, things like that. But in the matchups where I think this matters... Um, which are those blue matchups where they're holding up a spell star sprite or holding up a counter spell. Um, this is going to be a really awkward spell to deal with. So I really like this card. I think it's surprisingly undervalued right now. Not a whole lot of people are talking about it. And I think this card's going to be better than, say, Judges Familiar or um, the uh, Fairy Stun Stun Master or whatever it was called. The um, the Kicker Stun a Card. Uh, 1-1 one, one Fairy that came out in Wilds of Eldraine that uh, a lot of people were excited about. So I, I think this card's probably quite good. Um, yeah, uh, strong strong blue card to uh, to lead things out with. Uh, next up we have a functional reprint, but not really. Um, Desperate Bloodseeker. <clears throat> a 2-2 Vampire for a black and a colorless. It has lifelink. And when it enters the battlefield, target player mills two cards. Now, there are some very interesting play patterns that come along with the tag target player mills two cards on ETB because flicker and bounce and reanimate all become very interesting when you can mill your opponent, not just yourself. Um, but largely, I think this is probably going to target yourself, let's be honest. So in, say, the Golgari Dredge deck that has been very, very popular lately, this is a Effectively, Meyer Triton's 5 through 8. I do not think it's better than Meyer Triton, but it is certainly another Meyer Triton. Um, that deck already has some, some very kind of lackluster 2-drops, so maybe this makes the cut there. Um, what what do you think of uh, Desperate Bloodseeker here, Josh? What are, you, what are your thoughts? Uh, it exists. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's I, I how I feel about a lot of this set. <laughs> it's it's a, um, a yeah. it's a card that's for sure. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it has an effect when it enters, uh, um, and when when it stays around. I think yeah, this card is probably. Uh, it's not going to be the flashy card that wins you games, but it's probably enough of a workhorse to fit into the middle range of something like that Golgari Dredge deck. Um, there's some interesting implications with this card and things like um, flicker effects, like in the Familiar's Infinite Flicker combo, um, where you could just mill your opponent out in instant speed, which is pretty interesting. Um this has really implica uh, interesting implications in like the flicker or the um, 
the turbo fog or uh, familiars combo mirrors where they're relying on like mortuary mire to not mill themselves out um this could certainly get around that paired with a ghostly flicker or an ephemerate or something like that um, there's definitely some interesting options that this card opens up being an etb and repeatable effect so um, something to keep your eye on. I don't think it's going to be super impactful, but it is definitely something to at least keep consideration of as you're uh, building your decks and, and looking at stuff going forward. So one of those cards that I don't think it's going to be an immediate slam dunk, but it's probably worth noting. Yeah, I mean, that's honestly, vampires are not even that relevant of a creature type at the it's moment. It's not anymore. So. When we get a vampire liege, then we'll then we'll really be looking at this card. So when we get any liege. <laughs> All any. right. Uh, next up is an interesting choice, Raven of the Fell Omens. So this card is, is an example of one of my absolute least favorite uh, design types in Magic. I absolutely hate this design. I wish that they would stop doing it. Um, there is another one that I've talked about uh, hugely, which is at sorcery speed only. I absolutely hate that tagline on effects. I wish that they would just stop it. Uh, and this has another one. This is uh, this ability triggers only once each turn. So let's jump into the Raven here. No, it's I'm a one-two bird. You don't like this set very much. <laughs> it's a one-two bird uh, for a black and a colorless. It has flying, and whenever you commit a crime, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. This ability triggers only one each turn. So. Committing a crime, if you don't know, is targeting opponents, anything they control, and or cards in their graveyards. So anytime you target anything that your opponent has or your opponent themselves, um, you are committing a crime. Uh, so this is a pretty good drain trigger. Um, it doesn't cost anything. It's going to trigger every time you try to like kill a creature or tap a relic or something like that. Um, very strong effect, I think, on a pretty reasonably statted, reasonably costed body. Um, I absolutely hate the once each turn clause, but, um, I think in general, this card is going to be efficient enough and annoying enough to get rid of. It blocks goblin tokens, you know, it blocks fairies, it has flying, um, and, in the decks that want it, namely probably gardens into, like, the more aggressive matchups, uh, this is probably going to gain an average of like three to four life um, each time it comes into play. And if you review it that way, instead of looking at it at face value. So if uh, if you read this card as a one, two for two with flying, that ETB, if you've targeted your opponents four times, drain four life, uh, this card's great. Uh, and I think not enough people are evaluating the average uh, incremental advantage that this is going to accrue. Um, I think that this is one of those cards that's going to, like Harrier Strix, kind of tip the the scales in your favor in the matchups in which you want it, and be almost identi uh, like unidentifiable as a means to that that value or that um, pressure. So when your opponent loses and they're sitting there trying to figure out when they lost control of the game, this card's not even going to cross their mind. But in reality, this is the card that won you the game. Um, yeah, I really like this card. I wish that it triggered more than once each turn. God, that would be a dream. Um, but yeah, I think this card's pretty strong. Uh, what what runs through your mind uh, looking at this card, John? Where do you think this fits? Um... Honestly, this seems like something that maybe a mono black control would like. Um, we spoke a little bit beforehand, uh, the, before the video. I know it's a little behind the scenes here, but I think this is a good card with Kumbaj, which is something that's just mm -hmm. pretty easily abusable. Um, or even like if your graveyard hate of choice from your sideboard, because you have to have it, is uh, Relic of Progenitus, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then this is pretty free every turn as well. So like you're just draining for honestly if you have both of those out two per turn cycles not bad yeah if you can double up on this card it stacks up very quickly um i i think you got to be a little bit careful with kumbas witches because they do get to point a damage back so they can mm -hmm. if you have two kumbas witches and try to get too cute they can definitely kill the raven which would be unfortunate but um mm -hmm. yeah I, I think something like kumbas witches um you know, a deck filled with one-for-one one removal, you know, gardens, uh, black-blue fairies, that kind of deck, 
um swirling darkness uh defile snuff out uh all played very very well with this card you know just tacking on a little bit of extra value to your one for one kill spells are definitely going to add up over time um and this card's kind of annoying to deal with like it doesn't die to pingers it blocks the things that you wanted to block in those kind of weird uh go wide or um tempo matchups like fairies um it's not snuff outable god forbid uh you snuff out a raven of the fell omens god that would just feel so bad um so it, it's kind of annoying to deal with it's efficient you know it's only a two mana creature so you can certainly like weave it into existing play patterns pretty easily um yeah i think this card probably does a lot of work in kind of a low-key way very similar to harrier strikes so big big fan of that card big fan of the birds in this set to be totally honest um let's see next up is our first kind of like honorable mention uh which is a red spell moving into red we have quick draw so quick draw is a really interesting spell and i think a lot of people are going to uh kind of gloss over this card without fully understanding how unique it is so first off quick draw is a one red mana instant it says target creature you control gets plus one plus one and gains first strike until end of turn and creatures target opponent controls lose first strike and double strike until end of turn so like <laughs> that's a really really strong effect what do you what do you think here josh uh yeah no it's pretty interesting um i don't know exactly which deck i would want this in it'd have to be one that doesn't have an edict effect because uh, the relevance of this is that you're not targeting the creature your opponent controls, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. any of them. Sure. You're just hitting your one of your creatures and um, and your opponent. Yep. So this, on its own, triggers the um, the crime, right? Like you're committing a crime yep. with this card. Mm -hmm. um, it also has something that's pretty uh, unique, or something that I like to look for in spells, is that it has. Um, if it targets a creature you control, it also has another target. So if they just kill your creature, you're not out a spell completely. In that, in that it targets two things. Uh, so this card is... It's nice. It's good to have in the back of your head. Um, I'm unsure of where it would go, though. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, two targets means that if they kill the creature that you're targeting with this, the effect still resolves where their creatures lose first strike and double strike. Um I think it's important to take note when cards like this are printed. Um, this is the first time we've seen an effect like this in Popper. And much like Flaring Pain, there's only one card that does this type of effect in Popper. So it's certainly something that you need to be aware of and conscious of when looking at sideboards. Um, this card absolutely hoses hot dogs. So if you see Kiln Fiend decks starting to pipe up in your locals or in your leagues uh, all of a sudden for some reason, you know, slam a couple of these into your sideboard and just absolutely, absolutely crush them. Uh, it's pretty brutal against Kiln Fiend. But also something that I don't think a lot of people have evaluated about this card is how good it is against Boggles. Uh, Boggles has very quickly kind of fallen to uh, rely on Ethereal Armor's first strike. And... Well, I, I don't think you're going to be like, you know, quad blocking with goblin tokens and then quick drawing to kill their dude. Um, removing first strike from a creature that's blocking or a creature that's attacking into some big things and relying on that first strike, uh, this can certainly have a very potent effect there. So um, definitely something to keep an eye on. I think this card is very unique and I like to just take note of cards like that when they're printed. So I wanted to call this out here for all of you. Uh, make sure you stash a couple of these in your playables box just so you have them and uh, you, you've you got them available if you need them. I think these type of effects are uh, incredibly cool and we don't see them very often. So um, definitely something to take note of. Uh, next up in red is uh, a card, Josh, you wanted uh, this one on the list, so I'll let you take over the conversation, but I'll intro it real quick. We have Reckless Lackey, uh, which is a new red one drop. It's a goblin pilot. Uh, I think a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, it's a one, two for one red with first strike and haste. 
And you can pay three mana, sacrifice it, draw a card, and create a treasure token. Uh, what do we what do we think of this card, Josh? Um, so I like this one a bit. Um, unlike the Strix from beforehand, three mana is a lot in red. Um, yes. I don't think you're really doing this unless you're flooded. In which case, the treasure token maybe helps you cast the bolt you draw if mm -hmm. it's not a land. Um, I like him more specifically for the... Um, the cost on him, the body, and the first two abilities. Mm -hmm. One mana, one, two is pretty good. Um, honestly, the same stat line as the Blast Runner, um, although this has First Strike and Haste. I think that you want to run it alongside Blast Runner, and it lets you run a more Goblin-centric deck. Maybe get a little, more, little bit more value out of um, like Goblin Grenades, mm -hmm. something along those lines. Um, you know, like um, what's Gem... Gemstone Ritual, the one where you get uh, Brightstone I mean, Ritual. Brightstone Ritual. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, it lends itself to maybe going a little bit bigger um, with goblins, mm -hmm. or even in bigger in red. And I like this actually quite a bit. I think that this card's going to see some play, and I don't think you're really going to uh, feel bad about it when you're playing it, of course. Yeah, so that's a good point. I think three is a lot in red. Um, in my eyes, the easiest way to evaluate this card is something along the lines of when I look for a deck to put this in, I look at decks that are already running Synthesizer, and I look at decks that are consistently cracking Synthesizer to make Samurai tokens. Because any deck that has three mana to spend at sorcery speed, this is not sorcery speed, but Synthesizer is, um, any deck that has three mana to crack a Synthesizer to effectively draw a card and make a 2-2 body will have three mana to crack this to draw a card and make a treasure token. So I look at Boros um, for this, probably. That's the only deck I consistently see crack Synthesizer um, for its intended ability instead of just like Koldatha rebirthing or you know that kind of thing. Um, in that deck, I don't know that this has a place, right? It's not an artifact. It doesn't bounce an artifact. Um, but it does draw a card, and I think that in the few games that Boros kind of does what it wants to do but loses anyway, it's because it kind of gasses itself out or it runs out of synthesizers. Um, and this does give you kind of a way to double dip in your creature pool into drawing another card and creating a, t a treasure artifact token, which will allow you to play those Glint Hawks or those Skyfishers if they're stranded in your hand for some reason. So I do think that this card has a lot of text on it. It has a lot of kind of relevant things. You know, it is a sacrifice trigger. It gives you an artifact. It's a haste one drop. You know, these are all really good things to look for in red. So I, I think I find it hard to believe that this card won't have a space. Um, I just don't particularly know where that space is going to be quite yet. I don't think it's going to make the cut in Koldatha red. But you mentioned uh, like a goblin centric deck. This could certainly see play in something like, um, you know, Goblin Storm maybe. Uh, just because it doesn't necessarily need the goblins to deal damage. It just needs to, you know, generate big mana, go wide, and then uh, sometimes it needs an extra card draw here or there to kind of make sure it gets all the way to its uh, its matron into, like, bushwhacker kind of finisher uh, sequence. So this may have uh, some implications there. You know, it gives you an artifact for the Koldatha Rebirth into the Brightstone Ritual kind of stuff. So, um Super interesting card. Really like this card, and I look forward to seeing what it's played in. Um, off the top of my head, I think it'll probably find a home in Boros, but who knows? Uh, maybe a new deck that uh, really likes these sacrifice triggers is going to come out, because we're starting to get some very good value sacrifice triggers. I think that mm -hmm. Blast Runner with Lackey is certainly a, a card lineup that looks strong together. Um, because you can activate the Blast Runner at instant speed uh, to kill stuff if you need to. You know, you can give it Menace for four blocks while also cashing in for a card and a treasure token to cast the card you draw. So it's certainly a lot of power. I I'm interested to see where this goes. Mm -hmm. And something I didn't mention is the other creature type of it. Like Pirate, there are certain cards that... Oh, it's an outlaw. Benefits if you, yeah, there are certain cards that um, have a benefit if you control a pirate or if you control an outlaw. This guy fits right into that as well. So True. that just opens up a little bit of a a nice secondary uh, goal for the deck that you want to build. So 
yeah, this being an outlaw is definitely cool. Um, it also survives fiery cannonades if uh, if you're still seeing those. I think most people have hot swapped them to breath weapons at this point, but um, because it is a pirate and you can run things like uh, Crimson Fleet Commodore, uh, which is also a pirate, I mean, maybe you want to build a pirate deck that uses fiery cannonade to just one-sided wipe your opponent's board and leave your board untouched. I mean, pirate is is quickly becoming a creature type that matters and that has enough of them to maybe put something together, right? So um, that could certainly be an angle to take with this card too, uh, which I think might be a cool way to, to look at it. Good point. Um, let's see, after that we move into green. So I've seen a couple people talk about this card already. Um, there are certainly some combos flying around with this card trying to cash it in for value. Our green card from uh, Outlaws of Thunder Junction is Free Strider Commando. Uh, it's a 3-3 three, three for 3, so 2 and a green. Gets you a Centaur Mercenary, which is also an Outlaw. Um, and then it enters the battlefield with two 1-1 one, one counters on it if it wasn't cast or if no mana was spent to cast it. And then it has a new keyword for Outlaws of Thunder Junction called Plot, and this has Plot 4. So for 3 and a green... You can exile this card from your hand and then cast it as a sorcery on a later turn without paying its mana cost. So this is similar to like Suspend or um, uh, what was the one from Kaldheim called? Foretell. Foretell, that's it. Um, where you were kind of prepaying for this spell, but you get to cast it for free later. Um, this one specifically cashes in on that effect, where if you are able to plot it into play, it is a 5-5 five, five instead of a 3-3. Three, three. Um, but the relevant thing here is that it costs 3 mana, so a lot of people are excited to unearth this as a 5-5 five, five for an effective 1. Uh, people are kind of calling it Green Gurmag Angler. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think of uh, Free Strider Commando, Josh? What, what makes you excited about this card? Um... I just I really like it in a flicker style. Like I think this mm -hmm. card is one of the things that I've been looking for to try and make um Crotch Wrangler be more relevant. Cuz like the card just has mm -hmm. it's got in it's got the stats, right? It's got the ability it just needs like two one one counters on it to be an actual threat to be like to move up from that raven from earlier that we talked about to being like an actual beater. Right. Um and this card really helps with that. But for the life of me, like if you put a gun up to my head, I could not tell you the difference or why they felt the need to put uh, if it wasn't cast on the Free Strider Commando. Because for all of those conditions of where it isn't cast, like if you blow up an O-Ring mm -hmm. and it enters the battlefield, no mana was spent to cast it. Well, so that's not entirely true because it isn't cast if it returns from exile. Yes. So if the effect was specifically no mana was spent to cast it, when it returns yes. from Flicker or something like that, it hasn't been cast, so that ability exactly. would not trigger. It wouldn't get the 1-1 counters. Well, no mana was spent to cast it. But it wasn't cast. Entering play exactly. is not the same as being no cast. no mana was spent to cast it. No. <laughs> Entering it play the is field. not the same as being cast. I'm going to need some sort of a rules guru on this, because... <laughs> It makes sense to me, like even with my limited knowledge of the rules. That <laughs> you know more will... <laughs> rules than this. Entering the battlefield is not the same as being cast. Being cast is when it's Enter resolved the battlefield from is the... the trigger. The cast is a part of the resolution. It's seeing if it was cast, was mana spent to cast it, and it wasn't cast. Exactly. So therefore, no mana was spent to cast it. No. If it wasn't <laughs> cast, it wasn't mm -hmm. cast. And I know that you know this. I don't know if this no. is a bit, but... It's not. It's you're, not. You're it's better than God. this. You are such it, a no. better Magic player than this. <laughs> yes, I am. But it... I... It... Like, looking... The card itself, really good for, like, um, the recommission or the one you make a hero. Yeah. Uh, Unearth, recommission, all those are going to be good for yeah. this card. Super good. I just don't, like... That one little part is the only thing that I don't understand about this card. You're a you're a better magic player than this. <laughs> I, I but anyways, outside understand. of that, it's a good card. I, I I think yes, I think this card is pretty good. Um I 
I don't like that people are calling this green Gurmag. Um, and the reason is, is because Gurmag was good because it couldn't be snuff out. It couldn't be snuff outed. This can. Jumping through all the hoops to bring this back or exile it and make it a 5-5. Five five. It's a lot to ask for a green creature that costed you three or, you know, that you're trying to unearth. Like, you could, you could... Like, you can't unearth bigger creatures than this, I don't think, outside of, like, Bayou Groff, which is the same size, you know, something like that, maybe. Um, but you could certainly unearth, like, better creatures. Like, you can unearth a Crypt Rats. Mm -hmm. um, is it worth jumping all the hoops? I'm not sure. Um, now, where I could see this, which would be really interesting, I wish this had Trample. God, if this had Trample. Um, cause we have jewel thief. Why can't this have trample, you know? Um, but what I could see is this being in like the, um, the four color ephemer gates list that was popular a while ago. Um, because you could flicker this with ephemerate and then just cash in on it immediately at instant speed and make it a five, five. And oh, yeah. that's no pretty strong. Cast it. Um, because, because it wasn't cast and, um, exactly. I, I, this bit causes me pain. Like I, I know for a fact you're better than this, and I don't know why you're griping on this wording because it makes sense to anyone who knows how to play Magic. Does it though? Yes, yes, it does. Com, you know what? Comment section. Which side of this argument are you on? Does this text make sense, or is Josh right? I, I would love. I would love to to settle Whoa. this in the comments. Whoa. Please drag fair. him through the weeds. Both of those can make sense. All right, what you said is it no, would be No, no it it, yeah. it doesn't because the you're saying itself, it doesn't make sense. No, the sense. text itself makes sense. I'm saying the if it wasn't cast is superfluous. Well, you are incorrect and I will I will love to hear the comments below mm. tell you that you are incorrect. Cuz you better believe that we both read them. So uh, comment yeah. section get on him I, I only read the ones that agree with me <laughs> that's okay i'll read the ones that don't and tell him how wrong he is all right um, but just, just, we both know each other's accounts here so i'll know if it's you that's true that's true <laughs> um all right so other than that um i think this card's powerful i think a three mana that can be a five five is obviously very good i think one one counters has like a reasonable amount of support because it counts as a modified creature. It's also an outlaw because it's a mercenary. Um, you know, there are certainly tons of like one, one counter lieges that give trample that give first strike. So there's lots of like things that you could bake into this type of, of deck in like green, white, plus you get travel prep and like stuff like that. Um, there's certainly, I think ways to make this card good in the colors that it, it kind of naturally fits in. Um, I just, I don't like jumping through that many hoops just to have your 5-5 five, five vanilla creature get, like, chump block forever by playing tokens or just die to, like, a cast down. You know, that feels pretty bad. But uh, who knows? Uh, this card might be good enough to kind of bring <clears throat> green or, like, green-white back into the, uh, into the limelight, and we'll see what we can come up with. But that wraps us up for green. Let's move into uh, the lands. So we have a couple lands to talk about. Uh, a whole suite of new deserts. So first and foremost, uh, Conduit Pylons. Uh, this is the desert. It enters the battlefield. You surveil one. It enters untapped. And uh, it taps for a colorless, or you can pay a colorless and tap it to make one mana of any color. So Josh, what do you like about this card? Um, I like that it is the card that I personally believe to be the strongest direct upgrade in anything that we've gone over. In that Surveil is better than Scry. Agreed. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think anyone can say that Scry is not uh, right. worse than Surveil. Um, and I, I agree. I think this is probably the only card in the entire set that is popper legal that is a straight one-for-one -one upgrade to a card that is already played in the Popper Constructed format. Um, the Scry Filter Land is played in at least two versions of Tron. It's played in Flickertron and Ultratron, and this is a significant upgrade to both of those decks. Um, 
I don't think there's any way this card doesn't see play in at least those, although I don't think it sees play anywhere else. Yep. Um, then we have a full cycle. Uh, we have a full cycle of 10 deserts, which are dual color, interplay tapped, ping deserts. But we're only going to talk about a couple. So we have three pulled aside here. We have Lonely Arroyo, we have Jagged Barrens, and we have uh, Abraded Bluffs with a, a small note nod to Forlorn Flats. And those are the Black Red, the Black White, and the White Red Lands. And then we have Arroyo, uh, which is a strange nod, but it's white blue. Uh, and these all enter play tap. They all enter the battlefield. They deal one damage to target opponent, and they tap for two colors. Uh, they're all a desert, and they're all a non-basic land. So, uh, Josh, why don't you break the ice on these? Why are we talking about these specifically? Uh, so, the let's start with the least impactful. The uh, black-red. Um, I believe that one's going to be playable as like maybe a, a three of. Uh, granted, it's not typed. You're not going to be able to tutor it. So three is probably the right number just so you have one in a game. Uh, it's just going to help black or red, honestly, both um, burn. Or, and then you can also kind of help a black red burn deck list kind of come together a little bit more. Push mm -hmm. just that one extra point of damage. Um, then you have the white red ones. Whereas Boros con consistently runs the uh, gain one life. Mm -hmm. yep. I think that similarly, it draws enough. Having two of this card, you know, round about that number, you're going to find one in a game and it'll help you out. Just push a little bit more. Um, and then you have the resets with uh, Skyfisher and whatnot, if you have mm -hmm. nothing else to bounce. Sure, sure. But the... Um, that goes for the black white one as well. Same same yes, overall sorry. logic. Um, it's you know there are probably only two constructed decks in the format that want these type of lands that are still playing lands. You can cut very easy for them, um, which are the Boros Synthesizer list and the um, the black white blade list. Um, those are both running gain lands still, so you can very easy kind of hot swap two ish. Um, of these into that land base to give you just a little bit of extra reach on those Skyfisher triggers. You know, one, two, maybe three damage total, but sometimes that's really all those decks need to kind of close the game out. Uh, the Jagged Barons, the Black Red Land in Rakdos Burn or Madness Burn is certainly something that could give that deck a little bit of help. Uh, that deck can often get you very low very quickly. Um, but loses to something like Weather the Storm or, you know, Prismatic Strands, uh, Moments Peace, stuff like that sometimes. So having colorless damage on a land that's uncounterable, that doesn't count as a spell for Weather the Storm, you know, sometimes that's that's just going to give you the edge that you need. Um, definitely understand those swaps into the kind of aggro and or mid-range decks that are going to be able to use that that extra ping or two of damage um, to close the gap. But Lonely Arroyo stands out. Why is that here? Uh, Lonely Arroyo stands out because uh, it's the one that is in the colors that can most abuse it. Uh, ah, okay. Now, Makes sense. Um, it's, of course, the colors of familiars. The, uh, the win condition... Uh, used to be with Prosperous Pirates gaining infinite mana, and then you could do, honestly, whatever you wanted in the deck and you'd win. Mm -hmm. uh, infinite mana, infinite life, infinite kill your opponents. Uh, Lonely Arroyo fits back into that game plan of instead of having to wait a turn, now, or even however many turns it takes to kill your opponent with Mole Drifters, now you can actually just go with Pirates and Lonely Arroyo, and once you get your infinite mana with all your treasure tokens, you can then go ahead and... Uh, flicker the lonely arroyo and your uh forget that name you do that gets the spell back and Arcane you Master. Just... yes thank you uh arcane Master. and you just deal the 20 to your opponent or however much life they have just winning on that turn is a strict upgrade yeah i think Granted, um hearts. opening the door to familiars to win on the combo turn is definitely something that probably appeals to a lot of people um 
it does require running the Prosperous Pirates variant like you talked about, which has certainly fallen off in popularity, but maybe this will bring it back. Who knows? Um, certainly, certainly an interesting land to be mixed into the kind of aggro colors um, as a notable of these pinger lands. Um, it's really interesting. It's also certainly maybe playable in like um, Flickertron for the same reason where once you've amassed kind of your overwhelming board advantage instead of relying on like a Roiling Thunder or a Rolling Thunder or a Felden's Cane or like incremental value with a Denrova Horror or a Lightning Bolt over multiple turns, you can just blink them, uh, the Lonely Arroyo a bunch of times and uh, kill your opponent through pings. Um, not sure how viable it is in the Flickertron list, but certainly in the Pirates uh, Familiar stack, this could be a solid win condition. So definitely something to think about. Um, but that wraps up our notable cards for the Outlaws of Thunder Junction set. Um, yeah, really tough to, uh, to be excited about this set, I'll be honest. It just does not seem like there's a ton of cards to be excited about here. Um, really kind of let me down personally uh, i was looking forward to the, kind of the new design philosophy of less bad commons more good un or you know more good commons because there are less of them less filler um i was hoping that would mean more playable commons but it doesn't seem like that's the case um a lot of these just feel worse than stuff we already have and or you know very close side grades or slight downgrades to existing cards Really not much um, to have a, a huge impact on here. Um, that being said, while it's not going to affect uh, Constructed very much, there are a ton of good cube cards in this set. So personally, I'm excited for the cube impact, but I don't think we're going to see a huge impact from uh, Thunder Junction, Legality, and Popper. But those are the cards that you're going to want to grab just so you have them available in case any of them do turn out to be you know, the next Goblin Tomb Raider or the next Lorien Revealed. Um, I think it was pretty clear to everyone those were the best cards in their sets, and this set looks fairly lackluster, so I don't anticipate having a huge playable card like that. But, um, but yeah, man, uh, thank you for joining me. Um, are you overly excited about any specific card on this list um, from Outlaws of Thunder Junction? Anything really kind of catching your eye that you're excited to play with? Yeah, um, actually, I'm excited to play with the deserts because it allows me to live out the fantasy that my ancestors did. You know, Which... playing lands and committing crimes. But you already do that in magic. That's that's literally <laughs> a thing you've done already. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was... Uh... Yeah, bye, everyone. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Uh... Unfortunately, the set does look fairly underpowered, so it's going to be a little bit lackluster. But as usual, guys, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. Goodbye forever, unless I see you next time. Peace.